going to spend a few moments setting the context around uh, transportation infrastructure from a, a BNSF perspective and then look forward to your, uh, your questions and, and hopefully we'll have an opportunity for some, uh, for some dialogue. I suspect many of you here today are very familiar with BNSF Railway and uh, we've been operating here in Montana for over 130 years. Um, today we operate uh, 1,600 trains a day across the network you say displayed up there on that screen and it's our, uh, it's our uh, privilege to serve the many customers and geographic markets that we have the opportunity to serve and I'll touch upon those in a little bit as well. We have a very broad-based and multi-level risk reduction program to reduce the incident risk on our railroad. This multi-layered risk reduction program is designed to ensure that all commodities are handled in a safe and damage-free manner. Safety is our highest priority. It's the first thing we do each and every day. The rail industry as a whole is very safe and has reduced employee injury rates, train accidents, and grade crossing collision rates by 80% or more since 1980. And for BNSF, 2014 was the safest year in our history for personnel and the lowest ever for derailments. As I mentioned, we serve a diverse set of markets. We serve a diverse set of customers. The part of the pie chart you see up there that we call consumer products is really finished vehicles and international and domestic intermodal. That's essentially trucks and containers hauled on the railroad. We serve di diverse commodity segments and we serve very diverse geographies. And, and the opportunity and role of our company is to connect our customers and the geographies and the markets that we serve to each other. Last year, BNSF delivered more than 400,000 carloads of Montana wheat, coal, lumber, and manufactured products. We employ more than 2,500 dedicated individuals in Montana. And over the last three years, by the end of this year, we'll have invested more than $457 million for maintenance and expansion in the state of Montana. As I mentioned, we've been serving communities in Montana for a long time. And for the last 30 years, Montana Rail Link has been an important partner in providing safe, reliable, and efficient rail service in the state. And quite frankly, Montana Rail Link is a key to the growth and capacity capability of BNSF Railway going forward. As we talk about economic partnership in Asia, Montana is both a key producer of goods and a strategic transportation corridor for imports and exports. Montana is a resource-rich state and has always supplied markets outside the state. According to the Bureau of Business and Economic Research here at the University of Montana, more than half of the state's gross output moved out of the state last year. That includes both traffic moving domestically in the U.S and to international exports. International exports of tangible goods for Montana totaled $2.4 billion in 2013. 60% of the wheat grown in Montana is exported to foreign markets, and 80% of that is exported via the Pacific Northwest to Asia. Coal and other minerals supply mostly domestic demand, but more than $200 million of Montana coal was exported to foreign markets in each of the last two years. Korea is a top export market for Montana coal. Montanans understand that to remain competitive, these industries need access to a robust freight transportation network with trucks, ships, ports, and rail working in harmony. Efficient supply chain lowers cost, making Montana goods more competitive. The focus of this conference has been on the relationship between Montana and Asia in the energy industry. But as we consider the transportation network necessary to support that relationship, we have to broaden our scope. Because all tangible goods depend on much of the same infrastructure. A bushel of Montana wheat handled for Japan rides the same rail as Potter River coal destined to generate electricity in Washington state. I know that most people don't see trains, trucks, ships, cranes, and warehouses as things of beauty. I do. However, we all recognize that people want a vibrant economy, low cost of goods delivered, and good paying jobs. To maintain these in a competitive global market, the supply chain must be reliable, efficient, and able to attract investment. The U.S. freight rail network is the best shape it's ever been. America's freight railroads cumulatively have been investing at record levels for their own funds, not taxpayer dollars, 
to improve the safety and reliability of the rail networks and to expand capacity to accommodate growth. By the end of this year, since 2000, BNSF will have invested more than $53 billion in our network. The last four years have represented our largest capital programs ever. If we're also not making the necessary investment in highways, locks, dams, and ports, the U.S. is going to lose ground to other countries where the private and public sectors are working together to promote a seamless supply chain network. BNSF relies upon connectivity to all modes of transportation. We're not an island unto ourselves. Trade has always been the backbone of the regional economy we call the Great Northern Corridor, as illustrated on the map on the screen. This corridor is the primary east-west transportation route in the northern U.S. from Chicago to the ports of the Pacific Northwest. It has a robust transportation network of trains, ports, ships, and highways that support a $1.45 trillion regional economy. Montana lies prominently right in the middle of it. We need to start thinking about developing along the Northern Corridor on a regional basis. Canada has fully embraced this concept and in many ways is ahead of us. Through BNSF's operations at the Port of Vancouver, British Columbia, we are witnessing firsthand the singular approach between the local, provincial, and national governments, transportation providers, and ports to create Canada's vision of a seamless gateway moving goods between North America and the world. Tens of billions of dollars of private and public investment have been pooled together to support road, rail, port, and airport infrastructure. This is an approach we should embrace for the Northern Corridor in the U.S. Fortunately, Montana has been one of the states leading a collaboration called the Great Northern Corridor Coalition to sustain and enhance the economic vitality and global competitiveness of the region. This coalition is made up of eight state departments of transportation, Washington and Oregon ports, BNSF, and the Federal Highway Administration. It's just a start, but it's an important step. This coalition has received a federal grant to identify opportunities to improve the technology, operations, and infrastructure along the corridor. The next step will be to use the results to develop a program of prioritized investments that will improve in multimodal transportation across the corridor. It's smaller in scale, but we're taking the lessons learned in Vancouver, British Columbia, and applying them in Vancouver, Washington, where we're engaged in a strategic public and private partnership the West Vancouver Freight Access Project is a perfect example of this kind of partnership. This project uh, began in 2007, and it's uh, been ongoing ever since. It will uh, probably complete in about uh, 2017. It's about 50% done at this point in time. Essentially, this will allow roadways and railways to more efficiently access and egress the Port of Vancouver and remove the, uh, the impediments to train movement caused by the growth of highways and, uh, and other infrastructure over time. We expect that uh, rail transportation in and out of the Port of Vancouver will speed up by about 40% as a result of this work. By renewing our focus on growing the regional economy, investing with that philosophy will improve the attractiveness of doing business in all the states along the corridor. As a global transportation opportunities grow, they're going to grow with population. So as global population and regional populations grow, so does the demand for transportation. We've seen our demand for transportation ebb and flow with the economy, and we've also seen the demand for transportation on our railroad change both from a commodity perspective and a geography perspective. In 2006, our transportation demand peaked with international containers coming in through the Southern California ports moving into the interior of the country. That was a peak in units. We surpassed that peak from a gross ton mile perspective in 2013 with the mix shifting to heavier non-intermodal commodities moving primarily on the northern corridor. So we're moving heavier commodities, longer distances, and the work effort on the railroad actually surpassed the 2006 peak in 2013. From a unit perspective, we're not there yet, but the work effort on the railroad uh, already is. So as we look forward, we have to be prepared and make the investments necessary to recognize that markets are always changing and adjusting, and we need to adjust our operations and capacity accordingly. One of the challenges we've experienced in the last several years is that we've seen huge growth in the middle of our railroad in a segment of our railroad that uh, has not grown rapidly, essentially, um, for decades. And what we've seen occur is not only the volume moving 
through the Great Northern Corridor grow over the last four or five years. We've seen the volume terminating and originating in the center of the Great Northern Corridor grow dramatically in the last five years. In addition to that, we've seen a lot of customer investment in adding facilities in, the, in, the, in this region as well. So not only do we have the train traffic moving through the region, we have the train traffic terminating in the region, the train traffic originating in the region, and every one of those green dots has been an addition to local service of spotting and switching cars or trains in and out of those facilities. It required uh, tremendous increases in capacity for us to provide the service that our customers expect and we plan to, plan to provide. We've been investing in our network to make sure we have the capacity to handle future growth. We continued to invest even when the traffic was down during the recession. But the last four years have represented our largest capital programs ever, records for us and the industry. These are necessary actions as we've seen volumes increase and growth occur on parts of our network, like the Northern Corridor, that haven't previously experienced such high levels of traffic. In 2014, we invested a billion dollars along our Northern Corridor. We added 55 miles of new double track along our busy Glasgow subdivision, which runs between eastern Montana and western North Dakota. That double track was necessary not only to handle the movement of through trains, but also to allow the capacity for the increased work events of moving trains in and out of those expanded facilities along our railroad. We also added 21 miles of double track on our lakeside subdivision, which runs through eastern Washington. There were also 23 new or extended sidings that were built to support additional volume on the network. We're investing aggressively again during 2015 with a one and a half billion dollar capital program for the northern states. Building on the progress we made in 2014, we'll add more double track to our Glasgow subdivision and co complete construction of seven miles of double track from Ferndale to Custer, Washington. There are challenges that are emerging to both uh, future investment and, and adding capacity. These obstacles are being thrown in the way of infrastructure projects based on the unpopularity of certain commodities. Threats to investment in energy transportation infrastructure have implications for other industries. All sectors and regional competitiveness are threatened when the supply chain network becomes a battleground for things like climate policy or other issues. I'm not downplaying the importance of those issues, but when you can't build a road, bridge, or a rail spur because of objections to commodity type, we're traveling down a treacherous path. Just as there are opponents to coal, others don't like logging, copper mining, and modern farming techniques. If a project has environmental impacts, those impacts should be identified and mitigated. What we need to ensure is that there is a fair, objective, and timely review. Finally, I can't overstate the importance of railroads having the flexibility to adjust to market influences. Today, BNSF can price to changing market conditions, enabling our customers to compete. For example, current export markets require flexible, not formula-based transportation rates. If Montana is going to be meaningful, meaningfully able to compete and participate in those markets as they change, we have to be able to be flexible and market-based, not formulaic. Present-day policies allow us to earn a reasonable rate of return while we're doing this and make the investments. Grain, petroleum, lumber, those commodities vary year over year, and we're used to experiencing variability in commodity markets. On the other hand, the investments we make last 20, 30, and 40 years, and we have to be in a position to ensure that we can earn returns, reasonable returns, on those investments. The regulatory environment that we currently operate in allows us to do that and really supports what I call a virtuous cycle. Freight volume results in revenue. Revenue leads to returns. Returns re result in reinvestment. And that's what we ask our uh, stakeholders to hold us accountable for. As our volumes increase and our revenues increase, are we in turn adding capacity to the network to grow more? And we do have a bias for growth. And, and our approach is not to say we're going to pick this market or that market and invest in just that or support just that. Uh, likewise, we're not going to ration our capacity to this customer or that customer. We want to add capacity to support the growth of all the profitable opportunities that want to come onto our network. Montana's economy has enormous potential. Achieving it depends on a collaborative effort with neighbors to ensure a competitive environment. I think with two things, regional cooperation and a return to a sensible per permitting regimen, 
we can go a long way towards positioning Montana and its neighbors to seize that potential. I look forward to your questions. Good morning. Uh, my name is Bill Brodsky, and uh, uh, let me start off by saying what a pleasure it is to be able to uh, serve on a panel with uh, uh, Attorney General Tim Fox and Executive Vice President uh, of the Burlington Northern, Steve Bob, and uh, to have Larry Guy and Chetta uh, pulling the strings for us here. So it's, uh, it's a really uh, great pleasure for me to be here. Uh, as you may probably heard in the introduction, and I, I won't stay with this part of the subject for very long, but the Washington organization is involved in, in quite a few different businesses. Uh, and I think there's a one common thread that, that, that feeds through that that makes it uh, especially interesting for me to be participating in the summit. And that is the, the common thread of energy, uh, transportation, and infrastructure. Uh, if you go through the companies uh, that wa are part of the Washington portfolio, uh, energy plays a very significant component in virtually everything that, uh, that we do. And so with that, uh, we have two railroads that are part of, of that portfolio, and probably uh, nowhere is it more obvious uh, than uh, in, the, uh, in the transportation business when it, uh, when it comes to the impact of, of energy. Today, uh, unlike Steve's presentation, I'm gonna talk about the little guy. Uh, uh, we are a uh, regional railroad with both of the companies that we have. I don't know how familiar most of you are with that segment of the industry, but uh, uh, it's fairly significant. There are 550 short lines and regional railroads that exist in North America. Uh, they range all the way from a mile or two of railroad and one customer to railroads the size of MRL and some that are actually a little larger in terms of uh, revenues and mileage. And uh, I think that it's, uh, they play a very key role in all of this. Uh, for one thing, the regional railroads and short line railroads are, are really run by true entrepreneurs. So many of these guys have invested their life savings in, in putting together these operations. They do a whale of a job as advocate for their customers, and uh, they are big supporters of the, of the major railroads. So it's a, it's a critical part of everything that we do. So when we look at uh, a railroad like MRL, we're kind of at the, at the top end of that, uh, that particular scale. Uh, I wanna put a map of the railroad up here because we're gonna talk just a little bit uh, about the characteristics of the railroad and why I, I feel uh, particularly strongly that the railroad is so well suited uh, for the types of operations, the types of traffic that we're gonna be handling uh, in the years to come. Uh, as most of you probably are aware, uh, this particular rail system is part of the old Northern Pacific system that was built through Missoula uh, back in 1883. So we've had quite a bit of time to get used to, to operating out here. Uh, over time, uh, the railroad has undergone some changes, but there's some things that make it particularly, particularly adaptable uh, to today's environment. It doesn't come without its challenges. Uh, we've got some severe mountain grades that we negotiate. First one that we come to uh, is between Livingston and, uh, and Bozeman. Uh, that particular grade is on both sides, and it's uh, just a little under 2%. Uh, the second one that we, we ch as a challenge for us is at Helena. It's called the Continental Divide. It's a little steeper than that one. It's 2.2%. And, uh, and then the, uh, th the other one that we deal with is over here on the 10th sub. Fortunately, it's, uh, it's a 2.2% grade uh, on both ends of it, but we have, as you can see, uh, two routes running between uh, Missoula and Paradise. Overall, the railroad was uh, designed, uh, I'm not sure by accident or on purpose, really, when you go back as far as 1883, but it works very well for today's traffic. It's a high-speed railroad from a place called Jones Junction uh, all the way to Livingston, class four, 60 mile an hour railroad. Uh, it's class four all of the way across, aside from the areas that are restricted because of grades and curvature. 
And uh, one of the interesting things about it, for quite a period of time, uh, the railroad in key areas like Livingston to Bozeman was a double track railroad. Uh, there was a lot of capacity there, but during the period when railroads weren't doing so good, there was a big effort to rationalize and reduce expense. They single tracked the railroad, but the interesting thing about it is all of the grade, the bridges, everything are still there from the original construction. And so one of the things we've looked at in terms of our planning to try to stay ahead of the curve, if you will, on future movements is can we take advantage of that for what you would have to call pretty economic uh, capacity uh, if we ever have to add it in those areas. The same thing exists between Garrison, about 70 miles east of Missoula, and uh, Missoula itself, that was double track. Everything is still there. That capacity is available uh, if we're able to grow the business to a point where, where we need it. Uh, let me turn to, uh, to Montana Rail Link. Uh, uh, you'll notice, and I, I want to focus on Laurel for a minute here, because if you count them up, we've got one, two, three, four, five lines that, uh, that come into Laurel. And uh, it just so happens that Laurel is strategically in a place where all of the great traffic that Steve's Railroad is, is generating out in North Dakota, South Dakota, uh, Wyoming and uh, uh, down the, uh, the Bighorn side as well, down into Casper, uh, all flows across quite a distance without a significant place to really take a hard look at, at the train. And so Laurel becomes the first major classification location that we hit. So for Montana, uh, Montana Rail Link, it plays a very key role in supporting those types of operations, and I'll expand on that in a second. Rail Link is, uh, is about 1,000 miles of railroad. Uh, we operate the railroad with just under 1,200 employees. And uh, one of the interesting things uh, that we've seen happening here in the last few years is a significant growth on MRL when it comes to Montana business. And nothing makes us feel better than to see our local customers doing well. Over the past five years, we've had an increase of 22% local traffic, uh, a little over 4% a year. But particularly the first quarter of this year, uh, on, in addition to that, we were up another 15% in local traffic. So I think that speaks very well for certainly the, uh, the businesses themselves. Uh, it's great for us to have that type of growth in traffic. And uh, I think beyond that, the opportunities that that creates when coupled with the additional traffic that we're getting as overhead business is quite remarkable. And I want to I wanna talk just for a second here about the hiring that MRL has done. Now, like I said, we're one of the little guys. We have empl employment of about 1,200 people. But uh, over three years in the first quarter of this year, our company has hired 633 new employees. Now that's a lot for the company our size, and it's a reflection of the business on the railroad. Uh, some of those people that were hired are filling retirement uh, for people, but overall, even if we net net everything out, what we've been able to do is create 358 new positions on the railroad. A high percentage of that is in train service. Uh, they're very good paying jobs uh, for our employees. And uh, it, it's just really one of the highlights of Montana at this particular time and the growth that we're, we're able to achieve. One of the challenges that goes with that, of course, is capital. And Steve talked about capital expenditures on the Burlington Northern Santa Fe system. Uh, even though they may look insignificant uh, to you after his numbers, I've, I want to point out to you that uh, as for the last three years, we've been in the 50 to $60 million range in terms of capital into the railroad. If we take this back to the point when Mr. Washington started the railroad, uh, we've put $727 million back into the infrastructure on the railroad. Now, what that covers is the, uh, the normalized maintenance of the railroad. 
It covers upgrades to things like signal systems, bridges, tunnels, and it provides additional capacity on the system uh, looking forward. And in our minds, as a little guy that's trying to support the big railroad operations, our objective is to try to stay one step ahead in everything that we do to anticipate where the traffic's going to go and the service that's going to be needed to provide, be provided in order to handle that particular business. The Royal, I talked about Laurel, and I want to expand just a little bit on that because this is a very critical location, and particularly in terms of what we do at Laurel. It's a big classification yard, so cars coming from all of these directions get switched and go on trains and in different directions. But every bit as important is the services and the inspection that are provided to these trains. Safety is a big deal. These facilities run 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. So when these trains go in here and are rebuilt to go out, we inspect them very carefully. We're looking for things like wheel defects, safety appliance problems, operating, uh, adequately operating uh, brake systems, draft gears, uh, uh, couplers, those types of things, so that when, when the train leaves, we know at least at that point that they've had a very thorough inspection and are certified, really, because we fill out the forms that go to the Federal Railroad Administration that this train is good to go. Now, we do the same thing, actually, in Missoula, because we go quite a ways coming east or west to east, uh, again, without the train being looked at on our side. And so we perform the same kind of an inspection, round the clock, 365 days a year, on every train that moves through, uh, through Missoula as well. Everybody's interested in oil trains, and I would point out that MRL really isn't a primary handler of the oil trains. But uh, we do handle some. And uh, I think uh, the first quarter of this year, there were nine oil trains that worked their way through Missoula. Uh, last year, we handled, uh, I believe, 53 trains for the entire year that went through here. But uh, I don't want you to think because we aren't the primary route and where most of that traffic's going that we take it lightly. Uh, I've got three pages of fine print here uh, that represent new changed regulations that have occurred since the boom in the oil business that's taken place uh, in, uh, in the Dakotas and eastern Montana. Now, a lot of those are new, uh, new directives, uh, new regulations that have come out of uh, the regulators of the business. Uh, we consult regularly with BNSF to visit about what other changes maybe they see that they're making uh, that would improve the safety of the operation of the trains. And then uh, MRL goes beyond that. We have quite a list of things that uh, uh, Tom Walsh and his crew do here that go beyond uh, the regulatory requirements to ensure that uh, anything we can do that allows us to operate the railroad in a safer manner, uh, we're implementing those things, and uh, uh, it's a big part, believe me, of, uh, of what we do. Uh, so uh, I think from, from MRL standpoint, uh, we're in good shape uh, for the future uh, with the investments that we're making, the, uh, the people that we're hiring, uh, we're ready for the challenges. Uh, let me turn to uh, our railroad in Canada. Uh, Steve was also talking about the projects that they're doing up there, but this is our railroad, again a small railroad, but it's a class two. And uh, it's, uh, it's only 60 miles long on its main line, 125 miles of track. But interestingly enough, this railroad, in terms of traffic that originates and terminates on that particular system, handles more O and T traffic than we do on MRL on a thousand miles of railroad. So, needless to say, it's a railroad that has to stay fluid. You don't have a lot of room to put anything. SRY handles 70,000 car loads a year. And uh, they connect with all of the main transcontinental railroads. Uh, the Canadian National, the Canadian Pacific, 
Burlington Northern Santa Fe, and indirectly we even handle a few cars for the Union Pacific under arrangement that they have uh, with the Burlington Northern Santa Fe system. So uh, it's, uh, it plays a very critical role. Uh, I think in the greater Vancouver area, uh, an awful lot of the business is related to the automobile business because that's a key point for traffic going both directions in terms of automobiles. But uh, we're also working on some things that are very relevant to what we're talking about here today. And that is uh, work that we're trying to do in looking at uh, the, the dominant coal port uh, that exists on the west coast of North America. This is Roberts Bank facility in uh, uh, a rock's throw of the Canadian border, if you will, uh, and uh, with the U.S. It uh, consists of two primary operations. Delta Port is a large container facility. Uh, our company, C-SPAN, uh, does the ship berthing. Uh, one of the functions that they provide uh, for the container ships as well as the coal terminal up there. You can see the long spit that runs out to the facility. Uh, that's where all of the trains arrive, both container, container ships and coals. Uh, coal trains that are destined to, uh, to be loaded here. And we're working very closely uh, at this time with uh, West Shore Terminals uh, to try to find ways that we can improve the efficiency uh, of the operation of the terminal, uh, to find a better way to get coal from railroad cars onto the ships uh, in a more predictable way. Uh, and, and certainly a very important part of that is speeding up the cycle times uh, for uh, uh, those coal sets that are going back and forth between Montana, uh, Wyoming, and uh, the terminal uh, at, uh, at Roberts Bank. So I thought maybe if you, for those that haven't seen it, you've probably heard about it, uh, and it's... Uh, I think the capacity of West Shore is about 33 million tons a year. Uh, the volume moves around a little bit with the, with the prices for coal, uh, and met coal in particular. But uh, we think there are some opportunities there that will uh, uh, eventually translate to uh, maybe some more opportunities up there. Let me, uh, let me leave you with... Uh, a uh, couple of thoughts that I have on the industry. And uh, uh, when you've been around a long time, you have a chance to think about these things. But uh, uh, point number one, and you're going to wonder why this is a big deal, and I'll tell you. Uh, the, railroads, uh, the railroads at this point are a growth industry. And uh, it probably seems fairly obvious to you that that's happening, but it hasn't always been that way. It wasn't very long ago that the railroads were holding what I would consider at the time I started a going out of business sale. And for those of you that have been around a while, you remember the Penn Central, you remember the Rock Island, you remember the Milwaukee, where entire railroad systems disappeared. It was a tough time for the railroads. Assets were sold off, uh, and it, uh, it was... Uh, uh, very difficult to see historically old companies like the Northern Pacific uh, that didn't make it. The good news was the companies that stayed had uh, excellent management. They were able to go out and acquire lines. They reassembled the network, if you will. And uh, as a result of all of that, and the passage of the Staggers Act that allowed many of those things to happen in 1980, uh, I, couldn't, I couldn't support more strongly Steve's comment that the railroad industry in total today is probably the best shape it's ever been in in its history. Secondly, uh, I want to make sure that it's clear to everybody that the, the little guys, the short lines and regionals, are, uh, are privately funded as well. And uh, so these guys are digging deep, putting in their own money. Uh, attracting investors with the success of their businesses. Uh, and that's an important part of the equation, I believe, uh, in the success that they're enjoying. And then finally, safety. Uh, safety uh, of the public, uh, safety of our employees, the quality of our environment, 
Those are things that are fundamental to virtually everything that we can do in the railroad business to meet the transportation challenge. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. And uh, we're going to switch gears here a little bit. You probably wonder why a, an elected official and lawyer follows two very distinguished rail transportation executives. And I have to tell you, I was railroaded. It's good to be uh, here at the university to come home to my alma mater to participate in such a prestigious event as this year's Mansfield Conference. I have real fond memories of my time here uh, on this campus, and particularly in this theater now named after the, uh, the man and his wife who uh, the man was the president of the university while I was here, George Dennison. And in this particular classroom, I, I guess I call it a classroom, a theater, uh, I have fond memories because when I was an undergraduate, uh, the very famed historian and Montana University professor, K. Ross Toole, uh, some of you may have heard of, uh, announced his retirement. So they opened enrollment to his Montana history class. And so I sat in this room with hundreds of my fellow students and just listened in wonder to uh, Professor Toole's stories about our very uh, storied history here in Montana. And then fast forwarding later, uh, my daughter Caroline was up on this stage uh, playing her violin in the, uh, the Montana State Orchestra. And then more recently, I was honored to uh, be here when we bestowed an honorary Doctorate of Laws degree on uh, former United States Supreme Court Justice Sandra Day O'Connor. And I almost didn't make that event on my way over here. Uh, I was passed by a vehicle going about 110 miles an hour, and so I called it in on my police radio, and eventually a trooper got this person stopped. And uh, I figured I'd better stop too, because they may need a report from me since I witnessed the event. And eventually the trooper came up, and I was waiting very uh, patiently because I was afraid I wasn't going to get over here, uh, he came up and he said, Sir, I wish you could have seen her face when I told her, Ma'am, the reason I stopped you is the Attorney General had you clocked at 110 miles an hour. And to add insult to injury, her passenger also had an outstanding warrant. So my advice to you is, is please drive the speed limit on our roads. So I'd like to thank Dr. Kim and the Mansfield Center staff and the University of Montana for putting together this summit and bringing so many distinguished speakers here. Uh, I'm particularly grateful that they invited Steve and Bill to speak uh, because they represent and their industries represent what could be considered a part of Western iconography. The railroads, as you know, helped build the West by moving people, goods, and opening access to land for settlement. Today, they are the backbone of commerce for states like Montana. Uh, as was mentioned, growing up in Hardin, going to school here in Missoula, and now living and working in Helena, I see and hear trains regularly. The sound and sight of trains are so commonplace as to be almost unnoticeable by, by those of us near them every day. Now, while being stopped at a railroad crossing isn't anyone's favorite time in the world, I always find it very fascinating to see the different types of cargo on the trains as they go by. A wide variety of things pass through Helena. We see containers from cargo ships, lumber, grain, livestock, oil, and more. Among the most eye-drawing cargo are windmill turbine blades and Boeing airplane fuselages. And incidentally, as I'm sure many of you might remember, back when a train accident ended with a few of those airplanes landing in the Clark Fork River, after that happened, a colleague in my office noted that it brought a whole new meaning to the term fly fishing. Anyway, among the goods we see moving in Montana's, Montana's rail line through Helena is a very important uh, element of Montana's economy, and that are, that's coal trains. The United States holds the world's largest proven coal reserves, and amongst the 50 states, Montana holds the most. The coal being mined in Montana and northeast Wyoming is some of the cleanest burning coal of the in the world, and some of it has the highest BTU. While the current federal regulatory regime appears intent upon squelching domestic demand for coal, it's a different story overseas, as we've heard from many of our speakers over the last couple of days. 
Demand for Montana's coal will remain strong well into the foreseeable future as countries throughout Asia continue to grow their economies and will thus require even more energy. Even in China, where what we're seeing is a, show, a slowing in growth, but not an actual reduction in demand. The reality is that global energy demand will continue to increase as the world's population grows and more nations move down the road of development. The real challenge for us then is neither declining demand nor lack of supply, but rather access. While Montana's rail lines are essential for getting our goods to market, they are only part of the infrastructure necessary to ensure our communities have access to the global economy. Rail lines can get goods from and through Montana to other trade hubs, but export terminals are the next essential link in the chain. U.S. and Canadian terminals that export Montana goods are currently at capacity. So right now there are three new proposed commodity export terminals that will positively impact Montana uh, that are all located in uh, the United States. The proposed Gateway Pacific Terminal near Bellingham, Washington would be a multi-commodity dry bulk cargo handling facility. It would provide a portal for American producers to ship dry cargo such as grain, potash, and, and coal overseas to overseas markets. This project is in the draft environmental impact statement phase and publication of that draft EIS is now anticipated to be in the spring of 2016. Next, the proposed Millennium Bulk Terminal on the Columbia River near Longview, Washington would expand an existing port facility to accommodate loading of coal from rail cars to storage and from there onto ocean-going vessels. This project is also in the draft EIS stage, and it's now anticipated that the draft will be released for public comment in November of 2015. And the date for the issuance of a final EIS and regulatory decisions is expected to be in the first quarter of 2016. The proposed Coyote Island Terminal in, at Port Morrow near Boardman, Oregon involves construction of a new dock for loading coal from rail cars onto barges for transport down the Columbia River to a deep water port where the coal would be transferred to sea-going vessels for transport to overseas markets. The Oregon Department of Environmental Quality has issued four, per four permits for this facility, an air quality permit, a water quality permit, a construction stormwater permit, and a 401 certification that the project will meet Oregon State water quality standards. Yet, the Oregon Department of State Lands uh, denied a field permit for the pilings for the dock structure. That permit is the subject of an administrative appeal by the project proponent and by the Port of Morrow. And because our state's interests in the port, both Montana and Wyoming, have intervened in the appeal as limited parties. The matter is set for hearing before an administrative law judge, and the most recent indications are that the hearing will be held in February of 2016. So just as Montana does, the states of Washington and Oregon have thorough permitting and regulatory review requirements for these three proposed terminals. And fortunately, what we have seen play out in both states has been politicized processes that appear to be aimed at predetermined outcomes. A thorough review process that follows the scope outlined in law is the right thing to do. The elected and appointed public servants in Washington and Oregon owe nothing less to their citizens. The problem is that the scoping process for the Gateway Pacific Terminals EIS was driven by politics and not the law. After state regulators announced an unprecedentedly broad scope of review, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, which usually conducts a joint assessment with the state, made the unusual move of breaking away and doing its own review independently. And why, you might ask? Because instead of conducting a traditional EIS of the terminal itself, state regulators decided to weigh the speculative global impacts of the goods that move through the terminals. The Corps of Engineers knew that such an unprecedented EIS scope could not legally be used to delay, unnecessarily condition, or deny a permit under either federal or state law. In public comments filed with regulators during the scoping process for the Millennium Bulk Terminal in Longview, the states of Montana and North Dakota 
asked the Washington State Department of Ecology that it not apply the Gateway Pacific Terminal EIS scope in Longview because, and I'll quote, it, unrealistically, it is unrealistically broad, includes speculative impacts, requires impossible assessments of foreign environmental impacts, and appears to have been designed to hinder the development of that terminal. So the politically driven uh, process raises potential issues vis-a-vis -vis Montana's legal protections under the Commerce Clause of the United States Constitution. That clause enshrines, as you know, the simple idea that the free flow of commerce between the states uh, should not be impeded. We see, saw a glimpse of interstate commerce protection at work in 2007 when a federal judge struck down a Minnesota law that banned the use of coal-fired electricity generated from North Dakota. That law was struck down because it violated the Commerce Clause of the United States Constitution. So I'd like to elaborate just briefly a little bit more about Montana's involvement in appealing the Oregon Department of State Lands decision to deny the Coyote Island Terminal Expansion Permit at Point Moro. We intervened in that administrative appeal to protect Montana's Commerce Clause interests. In quick summary, our Commerce Clause concerns involve the Dormant Commerce Clause doctrine. In Article I, Section 8 of the United States Constitution, it is provided that the Congress has the power to regulate commerce with foreign nations and among the several states and with the Indian tribes. The United States Supreme Court has interpreted this clause to mean that unless Congress has manifested a contrary intent, a state cannot unreasonably discriminate against or unduly burden interstate commerce. This negative implication of the Commerce Clause is often called the Dormant Commerce Clause. So what we know of the facts of the case indicates that the dis there's a distinct and high possibility the Oregon DSL's actions violate the Dormant Commerce Clause in that the effect of the decision on commerce is clearly excessive to the supposed local benefits of the decisions. It is also telling that the proposed dock is to be situated in an existing port facility with an existing industrial docks in close proximity and that local governments in the area of the proposal overwhelmingly support the proposal. If the final agency decision appears to us to violate the Dormant com uh, Commerce Clause, we want Montana to be situated to obtain appropriate judicial review of that decision, and that's why we are involved in that case. Montana's involvement in the export terminals is nothing new. Former Montana Governor Schweitzer lobbied heavily for the permitting and construction of these ports and even uh, did so personally in Washington state by testifying at public hearings and meeting with officials. By entering the process at the most recent and current phases, the Attorney General's office has made it clear that the state of Montana has a significant legal interest in these terminals, undergoing fair evaluation and permitting processes, not processes that are engineered to arrive at a predetermined outcome. But unfortunately, coal isn't the only Montana commodity whose transportation has been politicized. While crude oil from the Bakken region and elsewhere in Montana is not a commodity that we export overseas typically all that much yet, it nonetheless plays an important role in the global energy economy. Just as with all Montana commodities, infrastructure is a key part of any discussion about the future of Montana's oil and gas industry. One area where Montana has been quite vocal is the Keystone XL pipeline. Every member of our congressional delegation, our past and present governor, and my office have been adamant that the pipeline should be approved by the federal authorities. And I noticed in the Missoulian this morning that Governor Bullock reiterated uh, his administration's position that the Keystone XL should be built. An operational pipeline would give Montana's oil a direct and reliable route to refineries, this would also bring the added benefit of freeing up space on rail lines, space that could be used to ship other Montana commodities, including exports, to market. Like the export terminals on the coast, the Keystone Pipeline approval process, again, has been politicized. This impacts not just Montanans, but the rest of the country and the global energy economy as well. In closing, I'd like to once again ex express my appreciation to the Mansfield Center and to you, uh, 
uh, Larry, for moderating this panel and to my distinguished uh, co-speakers. Um, it's been a, a great honor to come back to, uh, to the university and to listen and learn uh, with so many great presenters. Uh, I know that all of these issues that we've talked about are very important to you and to uh, not only our state and country but the world, and I hope that you will uh, uh, take away a lot of great information. Montana's export economy provides thousands of family wage jobs, generates significant amounts of revenue for state and local governments, and benefits the world over. Our farmers feed the world, our energy empowers it, our lumber builds its infrastructure, and our minerals fuel its technology. Montana is a quiet place in the northwestern corner of continental United States, but our reach spans the globe. Transportation infrastructure makes that possible. I want to thank you again for all attending and listening, and I would look forward to your questions and answers, uh, questions here momentarily. Thank you. As is often the case, first of all, thank you. We've received lots of cards. Um, and as typically happens, they fall very quickly into two or three categories. Um, and the first, and what I've asked is each panelist to uh, comment or not comment on each one of these that I throw out, so we'll move pretty quickly. But uh, certainly coal trains seem to be on people's minds. Uh, there's questions about how many come through Missoula, do they tip over more frequently than other kinds of things that are being transported? Uh, to uh, coal dust, uh, what uh, impacts does it have on citizens in the communities? So, Steve, I know that's a wide open kind of question, and I don't know what you were thinking might come first, and you don't live in Missoula, but I'm sure we're not the only community to ask these questions either. I thought we had an agreement that Bill was going to get all the hard questions. Do we? No. So, uh, look, this is, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll address. Uh, both coal dust and coal trains separately, because I, I think the issues uh, the issues really are separate. The first, uh, I, I think, I think we see across our railroad um, communities having uh, valid concerns about changes in the volume of trains that operate through the community, and those have all kinds of implications for for opportunities to mitigate the fact that as populations grow. And as commerce grow, there's going to be more trains coming, and I think that's a that's a valid um, line of dialogue that we need to make sure we're having with the communities that that we operate in. Is is what are we going to jointly do? How are we going to jointly work through the existing processes that are in place to mitigate uh, to mitigate growing train traffic? And that's everything from grade crossing separation processes to quiet zone processes. Those are all well ensconced in, uh, in federal regulation. I think that's separate and apart from what kind of trains they are. And I think the dialogue gets relatively unproductive if we're going to start saying we're going to balkanize transportation and, and it only matters what the train is. Because as I mentioned in my comments, um, some people don't like coal trains. Some people don't like mining of copper. Some people don't like uh, modern farming techniques and what we set up is a, di a, a situation where instead of having a discussion about how to make for a more efficient transportation system, we're now saying we care more about this train than these other trains and I just, I just don't think that that works. Relative to coal dust, um, uh, we, we began a, a process in 2005 actually of understanding that we were having coal dust releasing from uh, rail cars. And what that coal dust was doing is it was essentially releasing from coal, coal cars and the vast, you know, what we studied was how far it was dispersing. And essentially it's all going down into our ballast. And what that was causing us to have to do was more frequent ballast maintenance that has an impact on costs, that has an impact on capacity. And so we, we spent very extensive amounts of time understanding where was the coal dust going? What could we do to mitigate it once it got in our ballast? And then more importantly, what could we do to prevent it from, uh, from releasing in the first place? We did a lot of science. That science involved uh, putting monitors on rail cars, uh, wayside detection, and we discovered that a necessary step is to properly shape the, uh, the loads in the cars. 
The mines have all been very cooperative in doing that. We continue to have uh, uh, performance feedback on that. We have lasers uh, on our railroad that look at the shape of those loads and assess that and give that feedback to the, to the mines on a monthly basis. So that's a necessary step. And then a sufficient step, we believe, is the application of a surfactant that uh, prevents the uh, coal dust from, from releasing off the load. And that's been very successful. We've, we've seen the success of that um, in the impact on our ballast maintenance. We've seen the success of it from both wayside detection and uh, detection that we've put on the train. So, so we don't think there's any, um, any known um, community impacts to, to coal dust as an issue. Uh, I think uh, some of you probably recall, uh, I believe it was back in 2012, that uh, the city council asked that a coal study be done here in Missoula. And uh, at that time, uh, uh, the, the health department had uh, uh, solicited uh, a study from a uh, from a lab, and I can't remember exactly the name of the lab, but this got a lot of coverage in the media. And uh, basically, the results came back that uh, uh, as far as coal dust goes, uh, they could find uh, only what was insignificant uh, uh, amount of uh, product. And they also looked at emissions from locomotives here and uh, uh, found that there wasn't enough there to even come close to the limits as defined uh, by the regulations. So a uh, recommendation was that they not uh, do any further studies on this. So, and I think since that time, the good news is that uh, Montana Rail Link has acquired quite a few new locomotives that are actually more efficient and uh, uh, less pollutive than the, uh, the older locomotives that were operating at the time of the study. So I think it's, it, it speaks pretty well, at least for the Missoula area. Uh, of the nature of the problem. Okay, uh, our next question is, if not a little bit loaded, it's at least very provocative. So I'm going to present it. Are there railroad export options that would displace the need for the Keystone pipeline? Um, what I would say is first, uh, um, BNSF's position is that if infrastructure is needed by the marketplace, it ought to get built. So I, I wouldn't want anyone here to have a takeaway that uh, our view is that the you know that we would agree with the current uh, uh, process that's gone on relative to Keystone because we build and rely upon our own infrastructure. So so we think that if infrastructure is wanted by the marketplace, it ought to be built. I think that uh, you know all infrastructure has its place in all markets. And so pipelines have a, a valid long history in the transportation of many commodities, including oil, and there's going to be growing demand for pipeline uh, capacity in the oil markets as well. That said, we think that the railroad value prop is something that we've learned a lot about and our customers have learned a lot about. Uh, that's, why, that's why crude is uh, a bigger business than we thought it would be. And that's why crude is a more long-term, sustainable business than we thought it would be when we moved our first train on New Year's Eve of uh, 2009. Railroads can move to different destinations. Pipelines go one place. And so if you want to move oil to one place forever, a pipeline's a great option. If you want to move crude to a variety of geographic markets, some markets which probably won't be served by pipelines, then rail is the option. And so we see rail and pipeline as providing um, the right mix of alternatives. And while we certainly compete head to head, that value proposition will determine which way uh, our customers choose to ship their freight. And in some instances, um, we see customers who want to ship faster, they're going to go by rail. We see customers who want to not ship diluent which that's how you have to move things in a pipeline is by diluting it. If they want to ship uh, a Canadian oil sands in a non-diluted form, uh, the railroad is the way to do that. So it all comes back to what does the marketplace want, what do our customers want, and we think both modes play a role. I just might add that um, 
Well, I, I, I believe it's correct that the United States Department of State's EIS ultimately determined that there would be a net decrease in greenhouse gases through the uh, operation of the Keystone XL. One of the primary concerns of my office at the Montana Department of Justice is uh, uh, pipelines crossing across our, our rivers. Uh, and as we all know, we've had several major uh, events in the last few years with pipeline spills. And uh, I was uh, thankful that uh, our Department of Environmental Quality and our Natural Resource Damage Program and many of our other agencies in Montana uh, were able to uh, get significant input into the design of the Keystone XL to make sure that uh, we uh, do whatever we can to protect uh, our water bodies that are going to be uh, traversed with this pipeline. Uh, and so I think that's another concern that we all have to have as Montanans uh, with the Natural Resource Damage Program. We've been involved in that in the last two Yellowstone uh, pipeline, or excuse me, Yellowstone River pipeline spills. We hope to never have to do that again. Okay, we'll try to get one more question in here. Uh, and Bill, this, uh, we'll, we'll direct this one at you. This is one of about three new uh, rail links that's being suggested to MRL, and this one just simply says, why doesn't the rail link buy and run a route between Great Falls and Helena? The line you have other options, but between here. Between Great Falls and Helena? Uh, between Great Falls and Helena. Well, first of all, it's not for sale that I know of. We'd have to have Mr. Bob answer that question. <laughs> and secondly, I think uh, it really wouldn't do much to uh, to impact the nature of the traffic that interchanges between us and, and Burlington Northern Santa Fe. So uh, uh, right now, I think uh, there's some stored cars up there, Steve, and things, but uh, not much else on the line. And uh, uh, I, get, I think fundamentally it's not for sale. And number two, I don't really see where we would get much benefit out of it. Well, let's thank these panelists one more time. Uh, this session has come to an end time-wise. Thank you for your uh, participation. Thank you.